Are you willing to invest $2,600 in a human? Because you're going to spend $3,800 on a sprayer and you're going to take a picture of it on social media, <laughs> proud of it. Meanwhile, it. you put that stupid Craigslist ad out, must not be a drug addict, must not be lazy. Nobody comes in and you're like, this is stupid. I'm done. I'm working alone the yeah. rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Mr. Nick Slavic, welcome hey, back Lieber. to the Contractor Fight Podcast. You were on like five years ago or something, man. Six years. It was like crazy. It's, I, it's I been a while, I should have looked man, it up, but, it, but I, been, yeah, it's been a while. It's been fun watching you through social media. <laughs> well, we catch up a few times a year, which is cool, man, and, and this just happens to be one of them. I'm excited. I want to start this off by, uh, um, actually, I don't know if I could give all the details yet because my team doesn't have their fingers on this yet. Hmm. Let's just say that there's something cool that's happening at Mile High Profit Summit this September, and it might include you. We'll just leave it at that. There you go. Um, so, guys, you are about to listen in on a conversation uh, of two guys, one of which, not this one, is an absolute operations guru when it comes to uh, production in the field, among other things. Like, you're great at marketing and things like that. Like, But I just think... Dude, I, I've watched you over the years just get better and better and better. And so I, I just wanted to have an operations production conversation here today to help some guys. Because um, as we know, it does you no good to get a lead, get a sale. If you can't, you know, if I, I could sell the project at a high margin all day, but if I can't produce it at that, what good is it, right? And um, so I, I want to start um, with just asking you, give us a 30,000 foot view of nick i know yeah. you're a former army paratrooper you got a big burly beard you live in minnesota yep. give us the scoop for those that don't know you yeah so interestingly tom you're you're one of the people i first met in this industry uh when i when i walked around i mean uh you're a hard guy to forget when you go to your first pca expo and you see you speak you don't forget that very often. So um, the, the 30,000 foot view is I met you when I was a single owner operator of a very unprofessionalized paint company here in Minnesota. It's now my 16th anniversary of that paint company. We have anywhere between, you know, 30 people in the winter, 40 people in the summer, W2s, apprenticeship program, decent human being theory, subcontractors, Victorian mansion restorations, interior, exterior, residential repaint, all sorts of fun stuff like that, commercial work, things like that. Um, I'm also the uh, founder and host of Ask a Painter. It is a social media brand that I've had for seven and a half years. I broadcasted live weekly mm -hmm. for 402 weeks consecutively yep. uh, for that. And it, it connects me with people like you. It connects me with public speaking things. Uh, I am also currently the board chair of the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. Um, yeah, and I got four kids, and I live on a little farm in Minnesota. That's so, that's such good stuff, man. I um, and it it's funny because you you brought up uh, was it decent human being theory? Yes, I'm, I'm actually yes. going to talk to you about. You brought up your apprenticeship. You brought up ask a painter. These are all in my notes, so it's <laughs> it's cool. We're we're jiving here. Um, so let's let's do some math here in the summer you got about 40 w2 painters working in the field right uh you said subs 40? w2s we have full-time and part-time w2s and subcontractors too so all right so at any given time you have 40 40 peeps going all right Humans, I'm, yeah. and i'm i'm about to do i'm about to do some mathing for some people guys you take 40 human beings times just call it a 40 hour week okay that is 1,600 man hours a week, my friends. Okay. And before we hit record today, I was sharing with you that a lot of the contractors that listen to the show, they don't think in terms of, of man hours. They don't, and I don't want to like totally hijack our conversation here, but basically mm -hmm. you guys, the painting industry is incredibly heavy in man hours. So you have to be like, if you do a million bucks, in painting, it's um, it's like only 150 grand in materials, right? As a kitchen remodeler, you could do a million a year and 700, 800 is materials easily, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, Nick, I've always said that a million dollar painting company 
in my mind, and I, I've been blessed to work with so many different contractors in all different fields. So I think I, I can say a little bit to this, just having coached so many industries, a million dollar paint company to me is almost, it's like the equivalent of a $10 million remodeling company of the coordination that has to happen. And you know, there's and, a, yeah. um, there's a, a retired professor of entrepreneurship gave me a book about business. And in that book, it said, even manufacturing companies are three times less complex as a service company. So when we mm. do true, like B to C service company, you could not have more humans and more variables involved. So mm -hmm. owning a three million dollar residential repaint company is like owning a ten million dollar manufacturer in its yeah. complexity and need for management and input. Absolutely. Yep. See, you had you had more specific data. See, I just made it. I made up some numbers and you had them. See, that's why Nick's here, guys. Um, so I want to start I mean, in the just that context of of being responsible to not only sell, but schedule and manage 1600 man hours a week, you guys, you know, and, it, and if you just average, you know, 30 people throughout the year, right? Because seasonality or whatever, times um, 40 hours, times 50 weeks a year, you're looking at 60,000 hours plus a year, give or take that you are handling. And so yep. um, I just want to kind of paint that picture you guys a lot of you guys are freaking out because you got like two employees and you haven't figured out how to keep them booked and managed and trained so you're about to to learn some things here today so i want to start with this um i went to your website the other day and at the top there's a red button i believe that said we're hiring and uh and i'm like of course he's got that <laughs> <laughs> and when I go to your hiring page, what jumped out at me right away, and I'm not going to like line item this, we encourage, we'll put the, your website in the show notes. Um, dude, there is the what's in it for me factor all over your hiring page. Like if I'm visiting, looking at your page as a prospective employee, it's filled with what's in it for me. And, um, talk a little bit to just this, how it's evolved over time, because so many guys bitch and complain about not having people, but they don't even have something as simple as a we're hiring page that's optimized for search and that they market with. Um, how's that helped? How's it evolved? Give us some scoop. Yeah. The, the, the meta analysis of this is paint business owners and painters, they love marketing and sales. They just, they just love that. They think everything that's standing between them is marketing and sales, and they will devote hundreds of hours. They'll devote thousands of dollars, um, all the coolest apps, marketing companies. But when it comes time to hiring people, they mm -hmm. take one free ad on Craigslist and say, must lift 50 pounds, must not be a drug user, must show up on time, pay based on experience. And nobody comes in and they're like, kids these days are stupid and lazy. Nobody like, wants to work. They, they, they just do... <laughs> They put no effort, no money towards it and get no result. And you're like, if if you devoted some of your mental bandwidth and purse from marketing to clients to marketing to potential employees, you would get a result. And that is the unsatisfying truth of all this. So for me, Tom, it's it's more of like I have tried to grow business from hiring experienced painters and it doesn't exactly work as well as you want because uh, mm -hmm. sometimes they're the scariest humans you've ever encountered people who have 25 years of painting experience and come in. Sometimes they're not, but I cannot find enough of them to grow and scale this business. So what I did, uh, I reasoned on first principles and I thought, well, if we're ever gonna do this, we're gonna need some employees. I like the employee model. And so we did something called the decent human being theory, which is we just want good people and we can teach them to paint. And mm -hmm. in the history of my company, the data and the feelings, the feelings is I wanna help everybody. I'm gonna give this person their chance, right? We've all done yeah. that. Zero data points out of all the data points show that giving that person that chance works. I cannot turn a non-decent human being into a decent human being. What every paint business can do in the United States is turn a non-painter into a painter. I have never seen one paint business that couldn't turn a non-painter into a painter. So we start with good people, we teach them how to paint, and we hope that they can get out of their own way for long enough, mm -hmm. show up to work, live our core values so they can stay here long enough and get good. 
Yeah, and guys, this this applies to any trade, by the way. Yes. Right? You know, you can the skills can be taught, hire hire decent people. And so how do you how do you um what's that process look like? How do you know you're getting a decent human being? Well, number one, you don't, right? <laughs> I mean, we're just all <laughs> hiring hiring is one of like the <laughs> Hiring is like one of the most frustrating processes of my life because there's no magic interview questions. There's no magic ads. Uh, I think the best way to suss out decent human beings is to be genuine and have a professional business that can actually take care of them. And, and again, all the things I'm going to talk about, you could be a pond maker, you could be a landscaper, mm -hmm. you could be a roofer. These are just general business principles. Like, so number one, I believe that the best recruiting tool is not a sexy ad or a bonus system. It's we have a big professional company with opportunities. We have a training facility. We have people that love to train you, right? We have an employee manual that tells you about employment law. We have a pay scale that'll give you four $1 an hour raises a year. We have a four day work week. We have social events. We have healthcare. We have PTO. We have retirement. And we have a team that is so empathetic and supporting but also holds the standards yeah. that we can actually give you the things that all that everybody complains about with bad employers. It's, it's not, there is no tricks. There is no hacks. Everybody hates management that doesn't support them, crappy coworkers and low pay. Yeah. So honestly, like, again, this, this entire conversation could potentially be a series of unsatisfying truths that you already know. Just Nick says them. <laughs> You know, so it's it's literally you pay people a lot of money, you give them good people uh, to work around and you limit the chaos in their job. That's the formula. If you want to keep somebody for as long as you potentially can keep them, you do those three things. You're good. You know, you bring up limit chaos um, in in my first book. I say first because my second one's coming out in April. Yes. Um, winning the contractor fight. I talked about there's uh, there was a study done a thousand years ago, not a thousand, but a long time ago. Right. <laughs> And uh, it, it, uh, they identified across all cultures, economic levels, this and that, there were five main fears that people had. And one of those fears was a fear of chaos. And, and in the chapter in my book, I, I talk about that each fear that people have, and by the way, your employees and subs guys are people, and so are your customers, all right? Um, as far as we can tell. As far as we can tell. They have a they have a fear that demands a, a need to be met from us as a leader. So the the fear of chaos demands that Nick and me and whoever's a leader, we we provide an environment of order. So your people aren't necessarily leaving you for another buck an hour. You guys, they're leaving because there's chaos. Another fear is the fear of an unclear future. You've shared about that. Like you give these guys a path to grow in the company. What's in it for me? If I give my time, talent and all that to this company, am I going to be left high and dry later on? Or do I have a future? Cause you probably have, you said you got guys that love to train. Well, they probably came as an apprentice how many years ago. And you found that that's their sweet spot is they love teaching and coaching. And now you created an opportunity for them to do that. And everybody's fulfilled and getting paid and all that. So, you know, the, I, I think the, I always talk about success is an inside out game. And it's funny, I don't mean to keep citing the book, but in the book, I talk about uh, the, what's called the profit path. Many mm -hmm. years ago, I think it was at Harvard in the 70s or 80s, they did this study called the service profit chain. And that's where I got the idea of the profit path. And I kind of made it applicable to a contractor. When you don't have a profitable business, most contractors immediate i've done this where there's 100 guys in the room i go if you're not making money what's the first thing you got to fix i swear to god half the room says quality of work <laughs> okay because you're craftsmen that's where you go right yep. do better work well in reality it's the first thing is you got to be better as a leader the second thing be intentional about your culture the third thing is employee satisfaction mm -hmm. so again it starts with you and it works out all the way to the end where your customers are so they'll either say, you got to take care of your customers, you got to do better work. Very few of them are doing what you're doing, where you're taking care of making sure your team's getting oxygen. They have a future. They feel cared for. So um, what, what year were you in where this started clicking? 
because you you didn't start the business this way, right? No. And you didn't have the training facility and the apprenticeship program. And so I'm curious, like knowing what you know now, you got a guy who's listening to this, who's starting a business, he's got one or two people. He's like, I want to move in this direction. What do you tell him? Yeah, so this is my 32nd year in the trade. This is my 16th anniversary of running this business. And I've only really been intentional about this for five or six years. So consider the BC, mm. the AD. The BC was literally, I was in the unwashed masses, gritting my way through 100 hours a week a year. And yeah, now we're not. And it was basically doing some things that I already did well, just getting them on paper, turning them into a system, collecting the data, and just being consistent with them. And I think that's one mm -hmm. of the biggest things that I don't hear a lot mentioned in any service trade, which is the, the businesses that we look up to can do a whole series of unsexy, mundane, and sometimes boring things consistently. And that leads to success more than a secret app that some other contractor has. So that's what yeah. I found. Painter buddy of mine said to me, he's been trying to get his team on board with the vision he has. And, you know, he's tried to um, implement like regular company meetings. I think he's got nine or 10 employees just for context. Yep. And he's like, how do you keep them awake during the meeting? They act like they don't care. They, you know, like what, what are your, what's your meeting rhythm look like in your business? How do you, how do you get that buy-in from people? I, not, I would imagine it starts by hiring good people, <laughs> right? That have a good character, right? Yep. You got to start with a, you know, um, a good piece of clay, if you want to call it that, right? To yep. work with. But assuming you got some good people, you know, what's that rhythm look like for somebody who's having struggles? I have an opinion that sounds curt and sounds abrasive about this, but it's not. It's with love. Um, the best way to keep painters awake in meetings is not have meetings. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know that you even need to have meetings. Um, my meeting rhythm is... Um, I try to, I try to, everything in my business is simple. We do not add an SOP. We do not add a meeting unless it's absolutely necessary to the functioning of the business. So I only meet with my painters four times a year quarterly to give them a pay raise or give them, um, correction, things like that. Yeah. But it's a, it's a data driven meeting. Uh, I have two estimators, two project managers and an office coordinator. I meet with them one-on-one -on -one weekly, uh, to show them support and hold them accountable to the goals. I have done painter meetings and I too have people nodding off in the meetings and it's not because I'm a bad meeting runner and it's not because they're bad people. There's no, nothing they get out of it. I'm just going to be honest in my company. Now I do look up to some other painting companies and other service companies that do have regularly high interval, all employee meetings. If I'm being honest, I can't find much value in them in my company. Yeah. Now, what yeah. we do is I'm not saying these people are stupid and they don't understand meetings and stuff like that. What I am saying is we absolutely replace a formal one hour, once a week meeting with Slack communication. Mm -hmm. And we did 140,000 messages internally in the company supporting my people. So instead of a one, one hour meeting, I literally will have 10 to 15 messages between every single human in my company and that is the connection. That is the feeling of support that you that, that we think we're going to get from meetings. But yeah. in actuality, we're actually supporting them by the minute in the field. Yeah, I love that. I, I'm thinking back. We we settled on having a weekly crew leader meeting, not a mm -hmm. whole employee meeting. That was it was all data driven, factual, like report on the jobs you finished last week, report on the job you're on now. I'd give a sales and marketing update. We do 15 minutes of quick little training or something and get them out the door. Right. Yep. That worked for us. Um, yep. but here's the other thing though, back to your hiring page, <laughs> you are meeting You're, you know, you got boss lunches. I'm just reading from your site, happy yep. hours that you do shop barbecues, company yacht cruise, you know, uh, goal setting and review meetings, company holiday <laughs> parties. So there's meetings, but the meetings you're doing for the whole company, they're, they're more, to build relationships and yep. have fun and, and things like that. So I know you being a military guy, me being Marine Corps guy as well. Um, I found that, um, if you 
you work hard together, you play hard together, and then you recognize one another. That's why they have ceremonies and pin stuff on us, right? And, you know, because it's that public recognition. And so that builds a team. And so, yep. um, but I, I love what you shared about Slack. We use Slack in the fight. Um, it wasn't around when I was running a painting company. <laughs> and, uh, but so that, that could chalk it up because one, one of the questions I like to ask, and, and I'm sure in some way, shape or form, you asked this because you're like, you couldn't really find value. A lot of times we're overwhelmed because we don't answer the question, where am I busy where it matters least? Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, what are we doing? Uh, or if we had to make communicating in our business 50% simpler, what would that look like? Yep. Right? Ask a better question, you get a better answer. So, yep. um, so how, how and when did the apprenticeship program start? It's a two week apprenticeship. How are you filling those? How often are you doing them? What's that look like? Yep. I, I will say one thing that I, that I always forget to mention during this, which is a a personal thing for me, but uh, to that last bit of meetings and stuff, we have to ask ourselves what the goal is. And the goal is to get people on board with your vision, but asking them to get on board with the vision isn't going to work. Giving them a pay scale that incentivizes them to be on board with your mission is, because that's what they care about, right? Mm -hmm. um, once a week, I send a personal message to every single human in my company about something I appreciate about them. Mm -hmm. And for business owners out there, and this is not a strategy. I genuinely care about these people. And when over the last couple of years, when clients would do that to me or people from the industry would send a message, say, Hey man, just thank you for ask a painter. Like it's, I watch all the shows. It's really great. It's really helping. Like that means so much to me. And we are stupid to not turn around and do that for the people closest right. to us. So I, I would say that, you know, what you're not going to get from the website, you're not going to get all that is, a genuine business owner who genuinely loves and cares for their people, sending each person a message about something they appreciate about them. And that will do way more than any meeting will. hundred percent. So hundred percent, um, especially when you're specific with it. So it's, and you actually yeah. mean it. Yeah. That's, that's the big, if you copy yeah. and paste, Hey man, great work this week. Appreciate you. Have a good weekend. Yeah. 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 It's fine. <laughs> uh, so apprenticeship. Um, so five or six years ago, we got really serious where, we actually made a, uh, uh, we aligned the pay scale with the training, with the SOPs, with the promise to the client. Like it's a whole ecosystem. Whatever we promise to the client is something that we have to turn into a standard operating procedure. There's 22 steps to paint the walls in a bedroom. And then in turn, we train that and we built a 15 by 15 foot bedroom in our training facility. We built a mini kitchen and a mini bathroom. And we solely focus on wall painting, cabinet and trim prep and painting. And it's, it's, it's a very deliberate process where people meet with us, they onboard them, I safety train them, I get them into all of our apps, we hand them over to one of our trainers, I oversee the training, and we go through then the training progression. And we do the Doragi thing, you know, the demonstrate, observe, redemonstrate. It's just a standard way of training. It's not, again, we're mm -hmm. not, we didn't create anything new. We train yeah. people and we're nice to humans, right? We yeah. just do it intentionally. And so, yeah, it's, it's produced a really good thing. I've done classes as small as one, I prefer two to four. We've done classes as big as 12 at once too. So hmm. it's, it's been a lot of interesting data that came out over the years. What's, uh, what's the biggest challenge with the apprenticeship program? Getting over the head trash that it is boring and stupid and expensive to train humans, right? So uh, I, I am known for the data plus the feelings. The feelings is, you mean you're going to take one of your senior people and put them in your shop and they're not going to producing revenue and you're going to put two to four other people that you, that not producing revenue in a shop. Mm -hmm. When you actually break down the data from that, it literally costs about $2,600 to recruit onboard and train one decent human being. So mm -hmm. the theory is always there's the feelings and the data. The feelings is what the hell you built a facility. You're paying these people not to produce any revenue and all this other stuff. The data is 2,600 bucks. So when I get in front of people in a crowd, I say for 2,600 bucks, would you take somebody who's been fully vetted, trained, uniformed, and ready to go as an apprentice? And literally people like, I would take 50 of those right now. Yeah. It's like, yeah. okay, then. All right, let's get over this feeling that training people is stupid. It actually doesn't cost that much money. Are you willing to invest $2,600 in a human? Cause you're going to spend 3,800 bucks on a sprayer and you're going to take a picture of it on social media, <laughs> proud of it. Meanwhile, it. you put that stupid Craigslist ad out, must not be a drug addict, must not be lazy. Nobody comes in and you're like, this is stupid. I'm done. I'm working alone the yeah. rest of my life. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> what What are you doing to fill the hiring funnel? Like, you know, keep are, hiring. Yeah. So, like, seriously, like, you know, yeah. sometimes, you know, I've, we've heard this before, but you know, the worst time to hire is when you need somebody, right? Like, to that recruiting should be an all the time yep. thing. Yep. And I'm I'm just curious what your what are some of the tactical things that you're doing to yeah to uh, so recruit we people's pay and comp plans are based on the quarters and I love nice clean books so we start at least four apprenticeship classes per year starting on the quarter uh, start dates mm -hmm. and my minimum is to have at least two people in the funnel every time um, somewhere between six and nine months we can create what I would consider a crew leader, somebody who can do all the things we do on site without somebody like being a safety net for them. And at one year, we're absolutely creating crew leaders who can train another human. So really what I want is that constant, I want at least four classes a year coming through. And what's been really cool, Tom, is that we have invested so much in this where I used to have to, I actually broke all this down because again, data plus feelings. It took me about 50 hours worth of creating an ad, getting it out there, sussing through 110 applicants, doing 25 phone interviews, doing 10 in-person interviews, getting everything ready, onboarding them, doing that. And now um, we are known for this in the area. We've been doing it for so many years. Um, I put the word out locally in my community that we're opening an apprenticeship class and I put it out to my employees too. And mm -hmm. I say, hey, listen, remember those three things of, pay them well, no chaos, people they like to work with. Yeah. That one, I'll say, hey, Travis, I'm going to find you an apprentice. You can either find them or I will. So <laughs> once you get out there and find yourself an apprentice, and also I'll give you 500 bucks if we hire them. So now for the last two apprenticeship classes, they I have not put out an ad. I've basically just mentioned to the community, called a few people, mm -hmm. put it out to my employees, and we've been able to we've been able to capitalize upon the investment that we've made in this. And so, yeah, we're trying to do it really organically now. And the hit yeah. ratio goes up way better than when we throw something on indeed. You know, it, it's funny as you're, as you're sharing, one of the things that we talk about in the fight is um, always, always be um, uh, reviewing the quality of your cheeseburger. <laughs> That's just how we do it. Right. Like if you're, you could have the best restaurant location in the city you can spend the most on marketing, you know, you could have a line out the door, you know, at your grand opening. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a kick-ass cheeseburger, you're not going to be in business very long. Right. And that's what yep. you're doing is you're, you're, you're making the training better. You're making the experience, all these things that we could say are the cheat, the ingredients of your cheeseburger. Yep. You keep improving your cheeseburger and the people inside the business are basically just recruiting and telling others about it and it's part of the, it's part of the brand that you've built is really what it is you know when people think of, of nick slavic painting you know it's this is what they think they think high quality great people but it's been intentional to your point like you said over the past six eight years well and and it's uh, one of our core values is constant improvement because we are in the decent human being model um nobody is coming in here a fully fed fledged planer like even when we find somebody with experience that's a good start, you know, mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll take it from here. And uh, if we're not constantly improving, um, yeah, I think one of the biggest downfalls of people who touch mild success or taste mild success is complacency then, which mm -hmm. is, hey, great, we have success, this is done, wipe our hands, and then all of a sudden you start lagging in the future. Yeah. So staying on it, and if I'm being honest, eight years ago, I'm not sure we made a milestone improvement in any of our systems and processes for painting in eight years. They are tried and true. They're, they're guaranteed. We will upgrade the coatings every once in a while, but every mm -hmm. single improvement that we've made in this company is all human-based improvements and how we take care of one another. So you said you could take somebody and make a crew leader in a year running Easily, a job. Yep. Okay. How often... What is the training happening? What's that look like in that year? Like is I'm sure it's intentional because knowing you, it's yeah. intentional. It's not accidentally Super happening. intentional. Uh, four yeah. times a year, we will start a class anywhere between two and four people for our main W-2s. Um, I recruit subcontract. I have five subcontractor meetings this week to constantly fill our, we already have 10 partners that we love working with. I'm going to try and find another five more before summer, just in case. Why not? Mm -hmm. So it's constant, like always be marketing, always be recruiting. The mark of a good professional 
company, doesn't matter what industry, is consistency, yeah. which is you don't hire a person, they work out well, well, great, 30 years, we're gonna have this person. Nope, every, <laughs> every three months, I'm gonna hire another in hopes that I find that good person because you have attrition too. So mm-hmm. yeah, four times a year, we start a formal training process. And then four times a year, I sit down with every single full-time W-2 in my company and we track their data. We track their attendance and job performance. And in people's first year, in three months, you have to paint my test bedroom in four hours or less, right? We share that metric in our company. To pass your apprenticeship, we need to test out of it. In six months, we need you to be able to own and operate a sprayer. Like we need you to get paint in, get paint out, everything else. In nine months, we need you to be able to do a set of kitchen cabinets by yourself. And then in 12 months, you need to teach somebody else how to do those things. Hmm. How did you come up with those things? I, this has been one of the hardest things I've done as a leader and a manager, finding goals that will support the company, give people wins, but also not set a standard that is too high or too low. Mm -hmm. So um, there's things in my company that I feel like I push higher than the industry average, which is I really want somebody, we, we set up a process that between six and nine months, you really should be able to get everything we do under budget, inside, outside, everything else. I feel like that's highly accelerated, but we have a proven track record. There's things like how I pay my people that I feel is the lowest standard on earth. In order for you to get four $1 an hour raises a year, you need to work your 40 hours, that's half of it, and you need to get 75% of your projects under budget. And we have a very low hourly budget compared to the industry average. So in effect, and this is, again, I don't want people to think that this is me saying my people are stupid, my people are lazy, they're incompetent, that they don't perform as well as I want. What I find is that about 25% of the time people actually get raises if you say we need 40 hours a week out of you and we need C-level work. Not quality. We need excellent quality, but 75% of your projects need to hit that hourly goal. Only about 25% of my people at any time get a raise because of that. Tom, if that was me or you, I would work through that uh, pay scale and I would be a problem for that business owner. They would have to redo it. I would get so many raises. So this is not me saying I'm better than them. This is me saying as an owner, I used to set my standard at I want all my people producing between $150 to $200 of revenue an hour. That is unique. That is me, that is other fellow master crafts people that have devoted 30 years of their life, high pain tolerance, everything else. That is not an okay standard to put on your people. Mm -hmm. This is not me saying I'm better. This is not me saying they're worse. This is me saying I have a highly incentivized internal biological motor that will allow me to do that. I want my people to win. So what I found is that, you know, 65 to $70 of revenue an hour, if they can do that consistently every day of the year, we have a very profitable business. I would like them to be at 150, but guess what? If that's all they're going to do, I want them to win. I want to pay them highly. I want to limit their stress. I want to find good people to work with them because if I can get these people to stay with me for a long period of time, chaos in my life goes down, profit in my life goes up. Yeah. You have more predictability. You're winning. It's compound interest over time. You know, you're not starting, stopping, starting, stopping with a new team every five minutes. Um, No, that's beautiful. So, um, all right. I want to bring us home with ask a painter. So, you, so you're going on almost eight years of that. I mean, guys, think about that. What have you done every single week without, stu- without hesitation? Okay. Uh, unless you're a teenage boy. Um, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm always in junior high mentally. So anyway, what, but what have you done every week? Those listening, what have you done every week? For eight years, no matter what, I mean, dude, that's that's impressive, and um, and and so your 402 episodes you just did uh, of Ask a Painter. So, what, uh, why, why'd you start it, and what's the goal of it? Let's start with that. So interesting, you'd ask this. I am spending this year um, with my with my personal coach. And we are trying to do a revision of the entire Ask a Painter brand. There are four verticals within Ask a Painter. There's the flagship live show. There are in-person events. There's public speaking. And then there's content creation. And the bulk of what Ask a Painter is, over half my revenue and time is devoted to content creation, many of which nobody sees. And content creation is not my show, Mm -hmm. the live show. 
It's uh, a manufacturer will call me up and they say, we want six videos done over the course of this next 18 months. And then I devote a large portion of my time to capturing video, editing video, a, an immense amount of time. For every 30 second TikTok video people see of mine, there could be about 10 hours of editing into yeah. that sort of thing yep. as a professional level. So that's one of them. The, the retreats that I was talking to you about are another thing. Public mm -hmm. speaking, I do about 15 versions of, you know, uh, potentially something maybe in the fall That's and right. uh, where I go around to my people <laughs> and uh, we share some knowledge. Um, and yeah, so I don't know why I'm consistent with that for the life of me. I cannot diet and exercise, eat healthily and move consistently. Yeah. If I could, my life would be completely changed. So some areas of my life, I am a complete Bolshevik and some areas of my life like this, I have no problem being consistent. So the vision, the vision of this thing is being redone right now where I'm afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm like you said, constant improvement. If you're not constantly improving, you're yeah. moving backwards. And I do, I never want to be that guy who was making videos for the industry, made a splash. And then some years later, people are like, whatever happened to that guy, yeah. you know, or something gets dusty and old. I want to provide immense amount of value to this industry. And I think my value proposition is this is a lonely industry. Being a business owner is lonely, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at 30 to 40 employees, there's only about five to 10% of all businesses in the United States that employ that many people. So mm -hmm. my cohort of peers is five to 10%. And that might be generous. It might be 3%, right? So there's mm -hmm. only five to 10% of all the humans in the United States who can share some of the things that I'm going through. And that doesn't make me special, but it makes your potential friend group and peers yeah. Yeah. a small group. Mm -hmm. So loneliness is a big thing. What Ask a Painter is, is... I have done this for 32 years. There is no coding thing that people can't present to me that I can't solve. And I have mm -hmm. data for it. I've owned a business for 16 when the average lifespan is 18 months in the painting industry. I have done it big. I have done it small. We have subs. We have W2s. We've done commercial. We've done residential. We've done everything in between. And so there's not many people that also like being a loudmouth on social media who have martyred themselves for the craft done all the work of a hard business and can also communicate the data from that. So it's a unique thing. Like I am not, I don't have anything to sell anybody. I'm literally mm -hmm. a paint business owner from Minnesota who loves this more than you will ever find anybody else. Yeah. And I'm here to share. And in turn, uh, my life has gotten better with collaboration. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's been the greatest thing ever in my life, collaborating with other people. <clears throat> Well, you're wired to teach and help, right? And this gives you a platform to do that. Um, you know, you and just like comes, just like yeah. you, Tom, there's a there's a thing called servant leadership. Yeah. And magically, dudes like you and me, we find ourselves involved with youth sports, churches, community groups, volunteer stuff. Like we're just like you know these people. When I describe this human, everybody knows that person who's on the school board and is the t-ball coach and is uh you know at, at their uh, religious uh, institution volunteering. Mm -hmm. Ask a Painter is my version of that. Also, the Painting Contractors Association, the PCA, it is a lighthouse for servant leaders. It's attracted you, right? Yeah. And so it's this, it's this beautiful thing of we are biologically going to give back to others. The biggest problem for guys like you and me is finding a channel in which we can do it with the highest return on investment. Right. And right. what you do, what I do, are people who have found their groove. We have found right. that highest return on investment. So how, how has Ask a Painter helped your local paint business over the years? Have I you... made the argument up until about 12 months ago that it had no effect. Okay. Like, so what people think, Ask a Painter started all those years ago where I was actually at answering questions for homeowners. And the mm -hmm. first five shows, if you're, if you if you Google it and go back in the Wayback machine, I'm literally answering questions from people from my hometown who don't know how to paint asking me how to paint. And very quickly, a bunch of these nerds from the paint industry found it, <laughs> business owners and master craftspeople, and they took over. And so unbeknownst to me, my core demo completely switched. Yeah. I thought it was gonna be a homeowner show, it is not. What I do is only for other business owners from around the world. So people think I have this hack for getting employees and getting jobs. Um, if you query, we did 775 jobs last year. If you ask those people, what else do you know about Nick besides he painted your house? It's likely 750 of them will say, no, he's a house painter. I Googled him. I got a flyer and I just yeah. 
I didn't know anything about him. I don't follow him on social media. I don't know he's a loud mouth. I don't know about the PCA. I mean, literally it's like that. Now my two estimators, they go out there and they have noticed a critical mass of people mentioning social media in the last 12 months. So mm. I don't know if something's changed. I don't know if we hit a critical mass. I don't know if it's all anecdotal, but they're mentioning it more. My guess is with the amount of content that you've created, somebody, you know, if they type into a search engine, Nick Slavic painting, all these other things other than your website are going to be popping up. Right. You know, yep. and, um, and just the, the amount of that alone, guys, guys, listen to this. This is, um, this is what I mean about build your brand. Like, Nick, you have established and positioned yourself as the expert in this industry, Yeah. Yeah. right? So when somebody goes online, whether they watch the things or not, they're scrolling and they're like, my God, this guy's, it's Ask a Painter, Ask a Painter, episode 400, 402. There's a problematic amount of content out there. <laughs> yeah. And so what that does is when they're comparing, you know, are they going to call Chuck and the Truck Painting? Are they going to have you guys come do it? There's safety in a brand. Yep. There's safety knowing that, and, and they're, they already know before they pick the phone up, they're probably going to pay more money. Right. Yep. And all this. So guys, this is why for years, you know, both Nick and I have both been pounding the drum. You need to be creating content. Like, I don't care if you, you know, if you don't want to have an ask a painter or ask a carpenter show, at least pull your dang phone out. And when you walk into a job site, right, like introduce us to your team recognize an employee with a picture or a video. Um, you open up a wall and you find a bunch of bees in the wall or something, right? You know, make a video and go, Hey, every now and then we, you know, just the more you it, just start, you just have to start because then the way kind of opens up for you. You kind of find your groove. Um, you know, I started this show as a general entrepreneur entrepreneurship show back in the day in episode one. It was had a different name. We rebranded to the contractor fight in mid 2017 because, uh, you know, long story. And. But none of this would have happened if I just didn't hit record one day. Yeah. And so you guys are and I say you guys, women, you get my point here. I don't want to piss everyone off more than I normally do. Um you have all this knowledge in your head about your industry and you could fight this till, till you're blue in the face, but it's not going to change the fact that we live in a world where people use these little devices we carry around and they look shit up and they want to be educated and entertained and this and that. And if you want to really grow your business and get out of the middle of it, you know, beating the shit out of you your whole life and you have nothing to show for it when you're done, then you better embrace this stuff. All right. There's my soapbox moment. So, um, <laughs> it, it just drives me crazy because it's low hanging. It's easy. You're all like you, you're already answering these questions. You're already having these conversations. You're already, you know, whatever you get the point. Well, so. it's, it's one of those things too, where we, um, <clears throat> as a business owner, we're in the business of like pet detection. And <clears throat> sometimes we can like, we get too close to everything. And we always think about a specific app and try to get a result from it. But really, I took a step back about two years ago and I was like, you know what? Marketing has always been a weird thing where I never feel like we're really getting a good return on, even, even in some mm -hmm. parts where we were spiking a good return. And you start figuring out like, okay, instead of specific things, like there might be a mix of money and effort taking a step back from the whole thing. And as far as I can tell, we, we formed a generalized strategy that instead of shoveling all your money to a marketing company and hoping it all works or just going out there and dropping flyers by yourself using effort. Like I think a professional service company or any company is consistent where we spread out our time and money over 13 different things. And we are micro consistent, which right. is just like, instead of once a month, I'm going to make a new ad. I'm going to dump a thousand bucks into Facebook and hold my, hold my breath and wait for everything. Mm -hmm. When really what we found is that we took our marketing spend down over the last 18 months by 60% and we're still producing as much, if not more leads because we're making soup out there. Like mm -hmm. we're touching everything. There's 13 little things we touch twice a week. It's micro efforts. It's consistency. It's not one big push. It's effort. It's money. It's a combination of both. And 
I think that marketing strategy that, that we found to have success is the same thing in our personal lives and our businesses where you have to push a lot of things forward consistently. If you just crash diet and uh, mm -hmm. fast for a week, great. You got a momentary result. That's not consistent. That's not what professionals do. It needs to be a consistent lifestyle choice to where it becomes automatic. So yeah, I, I like those kind of meta discussions about, yeah. great, we can talk about a specific app, but we should really be talking about like spiritually, how should we be forming these systems, you know? <laughs> 775 projects Yep. in 2023. What's a breakdown of new versus existing clients, past clients? I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, I'm going to recite some data. This will be plus or minus 3%. 40% um, of all of our clients are word of mouth, repeat and referral. So we'll probably do, you know, just under 1.5 million in produced work just with word of mouth, repeat and referrals. Another 25 to 40% will come from direct mail. And then it's that 11 point mix that creates the last 20 to 30% of my marketing. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the bulk is the past customers, referrals, word of mouth, relationships, stuff like that. Right. And, yep. and th this is fresh on my mind. Uh, I, I got my hair cut this morning before our Looking interview. Good. Yeah. Thanks man. Beard trimmed and everything. I'm all good. But, um, I was giving my barber, his name's angel. I was giving him shit. And, um, and I said, you know, I've been coming to you for over five years and I got to remember to get my hair cut every, every a couple times mm -hmm. a month, you know? And he just looks at me, he's like, what? And I said, my wife, she goes to this place, they do her nails. If every couple of weeks, she's getting an automated text that says, Hey, your hands looking ready. Click here to schedule your next appointment. I Heck said, yeah. Angel, you got to be sending me something, you know, that says, Hey, it's been a couple of weeks. If your hair's looking a little ratty, hit the button. I said, have yeah. some fun with it, right? My point here for everybody, and you're doing this. Uh, in fact, I saw one of your recent social media posts where you took a picture of all the cards you're sending out to all your past customers. Tom, and literally, like that. I took a box of yeah. 775 <laughs> thank you cards. I literally dropped them off at the post office right before I came to my war room and sat down with you. Yeah, I saw the post. I saw the post earlier. And... There is money right under your nose, you guys, is my point, right? We work so hard to get new customers and we are all guilty of it. We all want to get new customers. I, I, I'm guilty as anybody else. However, you know, people are 80 something percent more likely to give you money when they've already given you money. They've already had, you, you know what I mean? Because you, they don't have to go through, they want to have their guy. They want to have their yep. girl, their company, whatever. Um, they don't want to have to go out and shop for a new contractor every time they got to do something. So, you know, I, I wanted to just touch on that a bit because um, lower cost per lead, you know, arguably zero in some cases, in, in zero in some cases, um, less price resistance. Yes. They don't shop around. They're not getting bids. They're not asking to itemize everything and jump through hoops because they don't trust you yet. And life's easier. And, you know, the other factor here that a lot of businesses don't talk about, we're running out of time, so we don't have to get into it a whole lot here, but like, is just the idea of lifetime value. Yes. I mean, yeah. you've been in business 16 years. What, you probably have a couple of customers that have been with you damn near the whole time. Absolutely. I remember my big six, the first six people that hired me. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm thinking our, my ideal client back in the day, her name was Julie. If I could clone Julie, man, I would have owned an island within five years, man. It was crazy. Mm -hmm. So Julie, like clockwork, spent 7,500 bucks minimum with us per year. She was yeah. that woman who every time Benjamin Moore came out with the color of the year, my phone rang. <laughs> 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 she referred us. She had a nanny. She had a big ass house, always had something going on in there. Yep. Um, always wanted Jose, my crew leader and his team. Cause they were like family. Yep. And so guys, you know, just think about that. If it's, you know, and you know, say it's, say your average tickets, five grand, right? If you're doing five grand a year and you got, you got a customer that's with you seven years, that's 35 that's grand. And if you got 200 of them, that's 7 million bucks. Yep. That's a lot. You know, it, it's a lot. And so, um, which is why you guys at 
or on the contractor fight email list get so many fucking emails from us okay so it, it was we're, interesting we're staying on your radar <laughs> throw throw a little data at that too which is i'm sure in some of your coaching calls you know we're in the dead of winter here and uh, i see it all over the painter facebooks you know the one of my favorite groups painting contractors that has 192,000 painters in it all it is is hey guys where can i find some leads where can i find some leads and uh yeah. You can use time, you can use money or a combo. And so we did an experiment this last year where I took my estimators, I sat them down and they called four years worth of past clients. They could make 70 calls a day, 75 calls a day, give or take. And for every 75 calls they make, they would schedule six estimates. Yeah. How bad and, do you want it? Yeah, there you go. We, we, we do a thing in the fight called unexpected intentional touches. And, um, <laughs> and we we've got guys that sell a million bucks a year from this where dude it's a text like hey nick it's tom from abc construction we built your garage last summer how's it looking it's yep. just a touch out of yep. the you know and if you do th this one guy i'm thinking of does three of these a day yep. five days a week and, he, and just from that alone he sells a million bucks to his already yep. existing customer base um, you have to make I was it doing easy a talk. People. I was doing a talk in Florida not too long ago, and I had everybody pull their phone out and send one in the middle of my talk. And this kid, 10 minutes later, goes, no way. And I go, what? He's this young contractor. He goes, I just sold a $15,000 project. I'm like, That's guys, awesome. this is what I'm talking about. Like, it's shit, dude. <laughs> we, we, oh, here's, here's why I'll end on the UIT thing with this. We have a painter here in Colorado Springs that did our house. Okay. They did our outside. They did our inside. We love them. I know who they are and I know how to find them. Okay. We have 20 to $30,000 of work sitting here right now that the queen wants to do painting wise. If they would just nudge us. Hmm. See, it's not, it's, it's not urgent for us. We know it's there. It's on our radar. If they literally would just send a text yeah. and say, Hey, How's the basement looking that we painted last year? Yeah. I'd go, hey, it's funny that you reached out. It looks great. Reach out to Lee because she's got a list. And this week she would sign the deal and they'd yeah. book twenty to $30,000 worth of work yeah. like that. So the point here, guys, is that people buy when they're ready, not when you always want them to buy. So yeah. it's your job just to nudge them along, stay on the radar, build the relationship. Make it easy um, for them. And make it easy. Like my, yeah. my barber angel. I'm like, make it easy for me. Send me the link that I push that I don't have to go in to the Squarespace yep. app and find it on my phone every damn time, you know, and, uh, and remember to get my haircut. I'm like, you got Valentine's Day coming up. I'd be sending a text out to the 4,000 <laughs> guys you got in your database going, don't wait to get your haircut and look get ugly on Valentine's Day. It's going to fill up and you're going to get in. I guarantee you, you will fill the chairs that, that week. So, Oh, yes. All right. So somebody wants to find you. Probably not going to be real hard. Um, no, with, you'll trip over you got sooner or later. But uh, um, where do you want them to go? What do you want them to do? Email is my favorite, nick at nickslavic.com. But obviously, if you get on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube and just type in Nick Slavic, it's not hard to find me anyway. I readily give up my email address. I readily correspond with anybody who wants to talk. Love it. Well, dude, I, uh, it's always a pleasure catching up with you. I always have a blast. Um, I, and you always, you always get me laughing and smiling because I'll bring something up and you're always like, well, I have data on that. You know, and it's just so cool. It's, it's like... <laughs> And, um, so I will, uh, we'll get your, your links and the show notes and all that other stuff, guys, share the show with another contractor, um, and shoot Nick an email if you need to, if you want to check out what he's got going on and how he's doing, ask a painter and all that, certainly do that. And, um, for those that want to hang out with him in person, probably this fall sometime around mile high profit summit <laughs> perhaps uh we have a we have a cool thing planned that uh we are ironing out the details with nick and a few others like nick as a special little part of the event and uh dude appreciate you being here man and keep kicking ass man appreciate you love what you do tom thank you thanks man